Next, we're going to talk about local structure. Local structure, though, is tied to the small world phenomenon in this interesting way. Two people meet at a party. Within a minute, they're going through you know, who they know, and sure enough, they find that they know someone in common. Now, what they're likely to conclude is, oh, what a small world, or it's a small world after all. But what they're doing is they're closing triads. That is, they know, say, A and C know B in common, and now A and C know each other as well. So this triadic closure is sometimes also termed transitivity or clustering. And what we want to know is how much of that is going on in the network. Because social networks, for example, are highly clustered because a friend of a friend is likely to also be a friend. But in general, networks do not need necessarily have this property. And we still want to know to what extent is clustering present. One way to measure it is with the global clustering coefficient, which is going to pit the number of closed triangles against all connected triplets. So if you have a closed triangle, it actually generates three separate connected triplets, and hence the factor of three in the numerator as well. If the entire graph is a one connected clique with all edges present, the clustering coefficient is one. And if there are no triangles in the entire graph, then this global clustering coefficient is zero. And we'll see in a little bit how to evaluate values in between. However, when clustering was first calculated by Watson Strogatz in their seminal paper, which we'll be talking about in the model section, they looked at a local clustering coefficient. That is, they calculated the clustering coefficient for each vertex, and then they averaged over all vertices in the graph. When you take the local clustering coefficient, it's as if an individual looks at all of their friends and says, out of all the possible friendships that could exist between my friends, how many are actually there? And this will, the denominator here is going to differ by whether this is a directed network, in which case if you have n friends, the number of potential connections between them is n times n minus 1. Or if it's undirected, say frequently friendship is treated as undirected, then the number of possible uh, pairings of your friends who could be um, who could be friends with each other is n times n minus 1 divided by 2. And as I mentioned, if you want to get the clustering coefficient for the entire graph, you just average over all the nodes. So let's see how we would calculate this for one vertex i. Here it is, and it has four neighbors, or four friends. Three of the friends all know each other, but the fourth friend they're keeping somehow hidden away. They haven't introduced him or her to the rest of their friends, and so all of those edges are absent. That, um, that fourth friend is not connected to any of the other three friends. So to calculate the clustering coefficient, we look at the number of neighbors, and we know that the max number of connections is n times n minus 1 over 2, in this case 6, but only three of the connections are present, and so the clustering coefficient is just 3 over 6, or a half. So I'd like you to try this with um, this vertex i, who has three friends. Can you calculate the clustering coefficient? OK, hopefully you calculated the clustering coefficient as follows. You have three neighbors, which also means three potential edges, because 3 times 2 divided by 2 is 3. And two of these edges are actually there giving you a clustering coefficient of two-thirds. Let's look at this from the perspective of an individual tie. What does it mean for that tie to be part of one or more closed triads? Typically, when a tie is part of such triads, it tends to also be a relationship between individuals who have some sort of affinity 
and are likely in frequent contact. What you see actually is that if two individuals are close, so A and B are close and B and C are close, you don't often see that A and C have no tie at all, right? So there's something about close ties and closing triads. And you can develop, or you can just use this measure of edge embeddedness, which is going to look at the number of nodes that A and B share in common, divided by the total number of neighbors with either A or B. And the higher that quantity, the more embedded um, the tie is, the more, the more it's part of lots of closed triads. Now, you might say, well, you know, I looked at my Facebook graph and some of those ties seem pretty embedded but aren't necessarily close. And I think, again, it's really important to think about what your network is. For such ties to be formed on Facebook, they may have just been, you know, everyone at the same high school adding each other um, on Facebook, right? So it doesn't, it, it signifies a shared context, but not necessarily a closeness. On the other hand, if you were to filter the ties to only be individuals who regularly interact on Facebook or regularly interact in real life, and you still saw a lot of triads, you would, um, you could conclude that, you know, this is really an embedded tie that's part of a, a closely knit clique. Just another example of this, so there was uh, an older study uh, that asked school children to name their first through eighth choice of friends at the school. We know how this turns out, right, from the dining tables um, data, uh, dining, ta dining partners, dining table partners data set. Um, but there is this interesting analysis that was then done that said, okay, let's go back to that thought experiment, right? Before we had an individual and their 500 friends and their, uh, you know, and 500 of each of those friends' friends, etc. Here, they just looked at expansion by two. And in one case, although this, this graphic isn't going to match, it's out of the um, Aral and von Alstein paper, but hopefully it illustrates the point. So when they used the the seventh and eighth choice, so these weren't their closest friends, the number of people n hops out was far greater than when they used the first and second choice. And the first and second choice looked something like this. It, my best friend's friend is also likely to be my friend. Um, but if I looked at my seventh or eighth friend and their seventh or eighth choice, I'm likely to move pretty far away. So there's this notion that it's not just, you know, the, the distance, but that the strength of the tie and the embeddedness of the tie matters as well. And the question is, you know, is it good to be embedded? Well, perhaps when you're in middle school or high school, being part of a clique is a good thing. Uh, it makes you feel secure. You have a gang that you can hang with. You know, it's good. But as we saw in uh, homework three with the uh, Aral and Van Alstyne paper, being a broker has some advantages as well. For example, the amount of novel information that you receive or looking at Ron Burt's papers, you're more likely to be generating good ideas and to be recognized for them if you're a broker. So it really depends, right? With, with all network analysis, it depends. Finally, <laughs> there's a study that said, you know, strong ties, weak ties, let's not treat them as binary. We just got this awesome data set. This was JP Onella and his collaborators. Um, we just got this data set that has, you know, a huge call graph, who called whom, uh, when, so you can get a uh, frequency of interaction on this graph. And they looked at how things might diffuse depending on the strength of the tie. 
So first of all, they found a skew in the degree distribution, but they also found a skew in the strength of the tie. That is, how often two individuals communicate. Many individuals, you know, many pairs communicate infrequently, and very few communicate extremely frequently. They also looked at the embeddedness of the tie, and I'll just do a zoom on this graph. They found that in general, there's a positive relationship between how embedded the tie is and how frequently um, the two individuals communicate. So it's, it's just a validation, right? Embedded ties tend to be closer ties, at least when you're talking about uh, phone communication. Next, they wanted to know, well, you know, so which, which is it? Is it strong ties that are crucial for information diffusion because those are people you talk with often, or is it weak ties because they can go further in the network? It turned out it was neither. It was the intermediate ties, the people you talk to um, every so often, not too rarely, but who aren't part of your very local clique, who tended to be most instrumental for information diffusion. And they did another thing, which was to randomize the weights of the edges. So in the real world network, what you have is that the strong ties tend to be embedded, but then they just change this, not change, but they reassign the strength of the tie at random to any edge in the network. And what they found, so potentially now, um, weak ties uh, became strong ties, etc., without changing the overall configuration of who talks to whom. And that caused information to move much more rapidly. So they did confirm that this kind of localized clustered structure is impeding network flow in a sense. You know, not, not, no judgment about whether that's good or bad. You can do even better if you look at the directionality of the links within a closed triad or open triad or even slightly larger structures because that will capture more the dynamics of the interactions that are actually um, you know, kind of driving the network or, or driving the edges within the network. So you can take a network such as this one and deconstruct it into different triads and then count, for example, how many times did you see a feed forward loop? Well, it looks like there's one here and it looks like there's one here again. So what does that mean? What type of a network is this? How would it compare to other networks or to random networks? So in addition to, you know, where, where do we have the Here's the feed forward loop. You have a number of other three node motifs. You kind of enumerate all possible ones. And so the feed forward loop occurs often in neural networks, uh, and it seems to be used to neutralize biological noise because X uh, activates Y activates Z, but X also directly activates Z. You can um, you know, you can encounter other things, so a single input module might be found in gene control networks where X might be activating a number of other genes. You can up it to four nodes. Why stop at three? Well, I'm going to tell you in a sec why you might want to do that. But here is a four node motif that has parallel paths and these you might find in neural networks and in food webs so the lion who eats the zebra and the antelope i think that's an antelope who are in turn each munching some greenery and uh, there are many more four node motifs than there are three node ones and it's more computationally expensive to get them but it may be worth your while if you have not a huge network to deal with the reason why it's computationally expensive is that not only do you want to get the the counts of how many times did the feed forward loop occur but what you'd really like to know is is that unusual i mean so so it occurred five times okay is that high or is that low and the way that you can figure that out is you generate the equivalent random graphs equivalent could mean that you just 
take the number of nodes and edges and you generate a bunch of Erdos-Renyi random graphs. Or you may think that some of the motifs are a result of a skewed degree distribution, in which case you want to keep the degree distribution the same. And what you can do is break the edges so each node has the same number of edge stubs and then rewire them at random and see even controlling for the degree distribution is the number of motifs that you counted unusual or not. And the way that you're specifically going to do this is you're going to calculate the z-score. So um, the in your erdos Reni random graph or equivalent random graph, you're going to get some counts and they're going to be normally distributed for the um, number of times that a certain motif occurs. And then you're going to see where in this distribution your actual count lies. If it's up here, it means that it, it's overrepresented in your real network and especially once you get z-scores above two this is what becomes statistically significant at the you know alpha 0.05 level meaning that there's only five percent chance that it occurred by chance that you saw such a motif um, similarly if you are all the way out here with a very negative z-score it means that somehow this motif does not occur in your network as much as it would if everything was just wired randomly you can download software, free software, that will run this analysis for you and it has this nice output, or you can actually also use iGraph. It has, um, I think there it's called Triadic uh, Census, um, but it's, the, it's very much the same functionality. What this research group, Uri Alon's research group, did next was to show that a lot of different networks fall into these super families based on a motif profile. And they, they designed this kind of measure that looked at the z-score for each of the individual 13 uh, three-node motifs and then just looked at you know whether the z-score follows one pattern or whether it follows another. And for example, language networks that have edges between words that occur adjacently in text, so to be or not to be. Um, that's a little four cycle in there. Um, across different languages, the motif profile is very similar. So your task is to find, you know, based on their triad census profiles, which two kinds of networks exhibit similar structure. Hopefully what you found, actually they're plotted together, is that the World Wide Web and social networks tend to have similar frequencies of different motifs. Not to say that all web is social, but that perhaps some of the dynamics driving um, social networks, for example, triadic closure, friends introducing one another, may also be at work in the web, where if one page links to another, it might start copying some of its links, again, uh, closing triads. So to understand this further, can you tell which of the following triads is underrepresented in social networks? Hopefully you've seen that it's this one, triad number six, and this, if you remember from the beginning of the presentation, is the forbidden triad. That is, A and B have a mutual tie, and B and C have a mutual tie, but somehow A and C don't have a tie to each other. And you might imagine that poor B is uh, really stressed out because B gets along with A and B gets along with C, but somehow A and C do not get along with each other in turn. So just to recap on motifs and, and clustering, so given a particular structure, you can search for it in the network. For example, you can count the complete triads, you can summarize that as a cluster coefficient, or you can you know, create this motif profile. The advantage is that these motifs can represent certain functions or certain um, trends. And, uh, 
and just you can validate by seeing whether those are present in a network or you can discover them you know hey this motif is very frequent in this network let me figure out you know what is causing it can i understand some of the underlying dynamics which is a real boost so for example if you have what you think is a good model of how your network is being generated and then you run the motif profile on your model simulated data and you run it on your real actual network and they don't agree it means that something's missing in your model and the motif profile is very rich in kind of discerning these differences um, one disadvantage of using motifs is that Again, it's, it's just like with the K-cliques and cliques and K-cores, you can look for these motifs, but you may not be able to tell whether they're actually part of some sort of larger interesting structure. So because you're looking with a microscope, you may actually miss the big picture.